Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our January catalogers training session. Um, if you can't hear any of us or it doesn't seem clear, please send a message in the chat. We'll have someone be monitoring that and we can try to make sure it works better. Um, it's the same if you have any questions, also put them in the chat and one of our staff members will make sure that the speaker is aware of the question and we'll get it answered for you. Okay, so moving on to the SHARE update, we do have the SHARE annual membership meeting January 13th from 3 to 5 p.m. You can register for that in L2. And then there's going to actually be a Dewey Decimal Classification class offered on Zoom on Tuesday, January 25th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. It will be recorded and posted on the training website on Moodle. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and you can go ahead and register for that on L2 as well. Edie, do you have anything for Bibliographic and Cataloging Standards Committee? I do. Good morning, everybody. So just a plug for the committee, there are still two vacant seats. So if you're interested, um, please let Donna Shaw know. She's the chair of the committee. Please let her know that you're interested. Um, we do have a meeting coming up on Friday, January 21st at 10 a.m. And that is by Zoom. Um, the event is available in L2, so you can go ahead and register for that. If you have any input that you would like the committee to consider, um, we need to get that to Donna Shaw, who is the chair, by the 18th, which is next Tuesday. Um, as always, anybody is welcome to attend as, attend as an observer. Um, attendance at this committee meeting does qualify for cataloging CE credit for those of you that are certified share catalogers. And even if you're not, if you're just interested, you're welcome to attend. I'm going to put um, Donna's information in the chat. So if you have any input that you would like to um, cataloging related input you'd like the committee to consider, go ahead and get that to Donna. So I think that's all I have about the Bibliographic and Cataloging Standards Committee. I'm going to pass it on to Liz Perkins, who's going to start us off on the miscellaneous section. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk for a second about the um, RDA toolkit. So the the PCC or the Program for Cooperative Cataloging announced that they will not be implementing the official RDA toolkit before October of 2022. Uh, they had previously announced that they would not implement the new toolkit until at least July of 2022, but that has now been pushed back. Uh, the PCC will also be starting a test in March or April of 2022 with their own catalogers to make sure the Library of Congress policy statements and other guidance in the new toolkit are working correctly. This test is expected to last several months. And what for this means for us in SHARE won't be implementing the new toolkit anytime soon either. The Bibliographic and Cataloging Standards Committee decided at the January 2021 meeting that a determination will be made on adopting the official toolkit once an announcement has been made of the termination date for the original toolkit. We'll get a year's notice of that terminate, termination date. In the meantime, we will continue to use the original toolkit until further notice and watch for more information. Um, anybody have any questions about that?
I don't see any questions in the chat about that. I did see a question from Joel at Mascuda. It says, are directors with cataloging certification eligible for the committee or is it limited to active catalogers? I don't think our, um, that the committee stipulates that it has to be somebody who is actively cataloging. I think it, um, I think a director with cataloging certification would probably be fine on the committee if you're interested, It'd be a good perspective to have. So I hope that answers your question. I did wanna um, kind of add something to what Liz talked about with the PCC implementation of the new RDA toolkit. Um, I just read something in a newsletter yesterday that the Library of Congress, um, before they start implementing the new toolkit themselves, um, they're going to concentrate on training their own catalogers on bib frame first before they go to the new toolkit. So this little item in this newsletter I was looking at said something about 2023. So Library of Congress is not going to the new toolkit anytime soon. So I think we will um, kind of watch for what they do. So um, I'm going to talk about the announcement that was made from Library of Congress that they have changed a couple of subject headings that have been controversial over the last few years. Um, one is changing the subject heading aliens to non-citizens and changing the subject heading illegal aliens to kind of a dual um, subject heading pair, um, non-citizens and um, illegal immigration, as long as that also applies. So OCLC has made an announcement that they are in the process of changing the subject headings within WorldCat records. And they have to date, I think, changed about 41,000 records already. So they're starting with the actual subject headings um, and you know it's not just the subject heading alien and illegal alien it's also um, lots of related subject headings children of illegal aliens church, church work with illegal aliens lots and lots of, of related subject headings so they're in the process of changing those um, when they get done with the main subject headings they will work on the fast headings um, some of it will be done in an automated um, process. Some of it will have to be done manually. So that's kind of the same thing in um, the Polaris database. We have the subject heading or the authority records for the new headings, and we will, we're in the process of starting to make some changes in our own database. So some of it we'll be able to do um, on a batch update, but Polaris's batch update for bib records is not that great. So a lot of it is probably going to have to be done manually. So it will take a while, but we are in the process of making those changes. All right. Does anybody have any questions about that? And I'm not seeing anything in the chat about that. I did see a comment from Esther that you don't have to be a member of the committee to um, attend the meeting and that's true. Anybody is welcome to attend the committee meeting. Okay, I'm gonna pass it on to Linda then. Good morning. I'm gonna let you know about a switch that OCLC has made to one of their terms. They're no longer going to use the term OCLC master record. They have changed that to OCLC, or, I'm sorry, they've changed that to WorldCat record. Although you will probably hear us use the terms WorldCat record and OCLC record interchangeably, we will be making the update to the SHARE website to reflect this change in terminology. Does anybody have questions? Okay, I'm gonna pass it on to Don. Good morning. Uh, I have a reminder section here with three items to touch on. First, on-order records. Please don't attach circulating items to on order records. Once you have an item in hand, it needs to be attached to a full cataloging record. On order records are only intended as placeholders to allow patrons to see what's coming and to place holds. 
It is not intended for circulation. So periodically review the ones that you have entered. And if you're a library that creates on order records, it is a good idea to check again periodically and delete or merge those records that you don't need anymore. Also, the next uh, item is the correct use of the volume field. So make sure you are using the volume field in the item record correctly because of the extra step it creates when placing a hold, which is very frustrating for patrons. Only use this to distinguish individual volumes on a record for a multi-volume set. Do not use it for series numbering, episode titles, reading program information, or things along that line. That information can, can go in the suffix field, the copy field, or a public note field. And finally, please blank out the encoding level when importing records. OCLC made that record uh, change, and now we are no longer putting a letter or a number for a full record. It is a blank. So remember to make sure that encoding level fixed field is blank when you bring a record into Polaris. Um, are there any questions about any of those items? And if not, we will pass it on to Sue for the next item. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I have some information for those of you who use Mark Report. The owners of the Mark Equality Company who developed Mark Report have retired as of December 31st, so the Mark Report software will no longer be supported by them. However, we still have Mark Report. We can still use Mark Report as long as it continues to be compatible with whatever version of Windows we're on. So we're good for now. Um, there will be one more update coming sometime this month, but that's going to be the last one provided by the Mark of Quality Company. <clears throat> since, then, since this is the last update, and we won't be getting any more regular updates, it may become outdated at some point, but for now we'll keep using it as long as we can. Um, even though the market quality won't be updating the software, we're hoping at some point we might be able to do some update, updates to the program, but that's you know yet to be seen. And we'll let you know when we get the message that the, the last update's ready to be downloaded and still just keep using it as is for now. Are there any questions about Mark Report? Okay, if not, I'm going to pass it on to Katie, who will talk about some classes added to L2. All right, hello, hello everybody. Um, so uh, Jennifer already talked about one, but I'll just go over it a little bit in more detail. Um, so upcoming in L2, we have two classes coming up. Um, the first is on January 23rd. 25th from 9 to 12 p.m. Um, and that's the Dewey Decimal Classification class. Um, that is one of the four required classes to certify as a share cataloger. Um, and it is the, uh, currently the only one that hasn't been recorded yet. So um, during that session, we will be recording um, so that we have all four sessions recorded. Uh, that class offers an overview of the basic structure of Dewey Decimal Classification System. Um, and there will be lecture and exercises for participant, participants to learn how to build numbers themselves themselves, um, in addition to an overview of Web Dewey. Um, the second class uh, is on February 15th from 9, 9 to 12 p.m. again, and this is Barcoding 1. Um, this is the first class in a two-part series, um, and the class will cover uh, learning how to find records in the database that match items in your hand, um, and we will cover effective search strategies and how to determ determine if a record is a true match for your item in hand. Um, and just a reminder, you can register for both of these classes uh, in L2. Thank you so much. Um, so after me, it's uh, on to Heidi with the CMC updates. Good morning, everybody. I am um, Heidi Margold with the CMC. I'm the metadata cataloger presenting on behalf of Dr. Pamela Thomas today. Uh, and I have three um, updates for you all. So the first one is our next online with the CMC will take place on January 20th. The topic is Dublin Down on Dublin Core. And I do have a link I'm posting in the chat if you'd like to register for that. The next um, 
update for you is that we are actually looking for a new metadata cataloger uh, to take over for my role. Uh, my last day at IHLS is this Friday. So if you are interested in the metadata cataloger position or know someone who is, here are the details for that. I'm also posting in the chat. And then finally, um, we are starting to compile our new online with the CMC topics for this coming year. So if you have any topics that you would like us to cover, please post them in the chat here today or feel free to send us an email. And I'm also posting our email in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heidi. And we wish you the best of luck at your new position. We are going to miss you greatly. Um, so we're going to move on to the informal straw poll. We've had some libraries reach out in regards to ways to identify local authors. And we have some ideas. I want to get a, just an idea of what people are doing, what they think works for them, or if there is something that you think works better, please do email me. We just, we're trying to figure out what's the best move to make finding local authors easier. So I actually have a poll, if I can get my screen to work, here we go. And I'm going to launch it and just go ahead. It's multiple choice. So if you're using multiple methods to identify local authors in your collection, go ahead and select those. And if you're not using any of them, do none of the above and then email me if you're using other ways that aren't listed. I'm gonna go ahead and do it now. And I'll leave this open for a little bit. So just take your time and let us know. And I'm gonna put my email in the chat. And just like I said, feel free to email me. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to our main pre presentation today, cataloging DVDs and Blu-rays. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. And two, you are good to go to share. All right, is everybody seeing the slide? Yes. Okay. All right. So this presentation is on cataloging DVDs and Blu-rays with um, RDA. And this thing's a monster. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to take a while. Um, we're not even sure we're going to get through all of it today, but we'll do what we can. Um, so we're going to be talking about the most current practices that we have with RDA for the original RDA toolkit that we're still using. So, but as always with RDA, and as we've seen, it's subject to change frequently. So this is just the most current that we have as of now. We're only going to be talking about DVDs and Blu-rays. We're not going to be looking at video cassettes. We're not going to be looking at preloaded video players like the Playaway View. If you have those, um, there is a little bit of guidance in the um, local practices on the Share Cataloging Policies and Procedures page. And also, I posted an updated copy of the editing checklist for video recordings um, in L2 today, and also it will be posted on the website. It's not a big change from the last one, just a few tweaks, but it does have some guidance in there also about playaway views. So if you have that, um, you can look there for some help on those. So as we go through, we're going to be talking about just general cataloging rules for Blu-rays and DVDs, but we're also going to apply those rules to cataloging a specific DVD. Um, and we're going to build a record for that DVD as we go along. And then we'll look at the completed record at the end of the presentation, whether that's this month or next month, depending on how long this takes. Um, so the DVD that we're going to be cataloging is um, Night at the Museum, Battle of the Smithsonian. And you can kind of see the screenshot there. Um, next slide, please.
Okay, so here are the things we're going to talk about. We're going to look at the RDA core elements. That's a term from the original toolkit. Um, so that's still a concept amongst RDA that the guidance that we're using. Oops, there we go. We're going to look at the different sources of information for um, the data that you get for your record. We're going to look at descriptive cataloging of the DVDs and Blu-rays and that there's a whole lot that goes into that. So um, that one will be quite a bit. We're going to look at subject headings. We're going to look at genre headings. We're going to look at the different standard numbers. We're going to look at different coded fields that we use. We're going to talk about some of the authorized access points or added entries. We're going to talk about related works and expressions. And we're also going to have some resources available that uh, can give you some guidance and help. So next slide, please. So here's our disclaimers. Um, when we talk about RDA rules and guidance, we're talking about the original toolkit that we're still using and we will continue to use um, until, the, until we get the termination date for when it's gonna go away. So, and also this presentation is based on um, a document that's posted on the OLAC website, which is best practices for cataloging DVD and Blu-ray, um, the second revision from August of 2018. So since this is from 2018, some things have changed since then. So we're going to use this document as the basis for our cataloging, but some things have um, changed since this thing was published. So we're going to be showing the best we know of the current um, guidance. And the different examples that you see, example records or example fields that you see in the slides, um, are going to show the spacing as you see it in a Polaris record, unless we specify that we're looking at a WorldCAT or OCLC record. Next slide. Okay, so core elements, this is a basic precept of the new, of the original, sorry, um, RDA. So this is the same basically for any format. So core elements means these are the things that you put in your record if they're available on your piece. If you have them, then they, they need to be present in the record. So that includes your title, includes your statement of responsibility, addition statement if you have one on your piece, publication information, physical description, and attributes that we're going to be talking about, series statement if there's a series on your piece, and various identifiers, which could be an ISBN, could be a UPC, could be a publisher's number, um, diff various different things that help identify the item. Next slide. So let's start with the basic basic, which is your preferred sources of information. So this really isn't anything new. Um, this was the same in the previous set of rules, AACR, that actually preferred source or what we used to call the chief source of information for a DVD or a Blu-ray or a video is what you get from the title screen or the title frames or the credit frames. However, in the last few years, there's kind of been a, I don't know, there's some options that RDA allows that if you don't have time to watch the first however many minutes of the video to get the, the um, title and statement of responsibility information, or you don't have the equipment to watch a DVD or Blu-ray, RDA does give some options of places that you can get title information from. Um, so if you can't get it from the title screen or the title frame, you can go to the disc label. After that, you can go to the container or uh, company material. You can look at the disc menu. You can go to an outside source if you have to, um, a website or the publisher's website. Um, and if you can't find any title from any source, you as the cataloger will supply a title. Um, and any time that you're going to take a title from other than the preferred source, then you need to put a source of title note in the record. And you know, as we know, source of title notes are now in a 588 field rather than the uh, 500 like they used to be. And you don't have to put the, the title in brackets. 
if it comes from some other source like we used to do, um, as long as you have that source of title note in the record, you don't have to put that title in brackets. So any questions on this preliminary part? And I'm not seeing anything, so I will pass it on to Jennifer next. And go ahead and do next slide if you don't mind. All right. So I'm going to be talking about starting with the title, and then we'll do a couple more sections. So for the title proper, it's the title minus any subtitle or other title information. And you're going to take it from the preferred source of information, which Edie talked about, typically the title screen. If you do take it from another source other than the title screen, make sure to include that 588 note. And then when you are looking at the bottom of the slide, that will be how it's formatted. It'll be a 245 subfield A title proper. Next slide, please. Okay. So when you are doing original cataloging, you are going to transcribe the title proper from the preferred source. You'll add variant titles for the container title only if it's significantly different than the title on the title screen. And that will happen sometimes. If you have multiple discs with individual titles, you'll use the collective title from the container if it's present. And the collective title is a title that applies to the resource as a whole. Um, thinking about it, I think like Monty Python's The Flying Circus. There's a whole bunch of different things included in it, but the overall collective title would be Monty Python's Flying Circus. And then if there's no collective title, record, record the first title in a subfield A, and then others in subfield B. If you're doing copy cataloging, if the 245 title is taken from the container and it matches what your item, you can leave that and that's fine. If you find that the title is from a source other than the title screen, make sure to include that 588 note. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've been doing this for a while, but just a reminder, when recording the franchise titles, or a collection of related films in succession that share the same fictional universe or are marketed as a series. And that's from Wikipedia, which is a great source and a great starting place. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are just some franchise examples. Hopefully most everyone recognizes them. James Bond, Toy Story, Harry Potter, items that we know are part of a larger series or larger group and people will recognize instantly. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so we do follow OLAC's best practice recommendations for recording the franchise titles. If it's stated on the item, record the franchise title and the number and or specific title as part of the title proper in a 245 subfield A. And you'll add a colon after the franchise title for clarity. Do, don't put a space in front of the colon. That will look really weird to us because we are used to having that, but it's okay and it is correct. However, make sure that you know if stated on the item in the first part of the OLAC recommendation, don't add the franchise title if it's not on the resource. Next slide, please. Okay, so recording, here's some examples of recording franchise titles. We have The Hunger Games and then Catching Fire. So in this one, the Sorry, I've lost my place on Okay, the indicators. Zero is for no added entry and the four is for non-filing characters. When you move down to the 246 with the varying title catching fire, the th indicator three is no note added entry and indicator zero is the portion of the title. So that's the title of the film while the Hunger Games is a franchise title. Okay, for the next 246, Indicator one is a note with an added entry, and that's because the title on the spine is different than what is on, say, the title screen or the disc label, and that's Hunger Games 2. And we use the subfield I to indicate where that was found. And then 246 sub or indicator three is no note added entry. And that's another varying title because we are spelling out the number two. And we're using, we're thinking how patrons would search for the film title. Okay. And then the librarian quest for the spirits, another example 
of your franchise title, the librarian, and then the individual movie title quest for the spear. So we do another 246 at the bottom to indicate the separate title quest for the spear. Next slide, please. Okay. So general material designations or GMDs, these are not used in RD, RDA records. However, it is share local practice to add a GMD to all video recordings in Polaris. Please know this is a local edit only. Do not add any GMDs to WorldCat records in OCLC. Okay, excuse me for just a second. Sorry about that. Okay, so subfield H, which is a GMD, comes after subfield A, N, and P, but it comes before subfield B. The example at the bottom shows the proper placement. You have subfield A, your title proper, and then subfield H, video recording. Next slide, please. And I just saw a question come in from Susan. I've come across OCLC records with GMD in them. We don't remove those in the OCLC, OCLC records, do we? I probably would. However, does Edie or any of the other catalogers have an opinion on this? Um, this is Edie. I usually take them out. Um, is, is, well, I guess it depends. Is the record an AACR record? Or is it, has it been upgraded to RDA? If it's still showing as an AACR record, then I guess the GMD is not wrong. Um, if it's been upgraded to RDA, then you definitely need to take it out. Sometimes it's been a PCC record, which I was told never to edit those in OCLC. Oh, PCC, yeah, it won't let you. Well, sometimes, but yeah, a lot of times so it won't let you edit. I should try to edit it if I can and take that out in the map in the- If, if it lets you, OCLC yeah, take it record. out. God, it's gonna be hard to change my phrasing. So yeah. yeah, if it lets you take it out, I would. And then put it back in to do the local to write yeah. it down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Good question, Susan. All right. So we are on other title information. So different punctuation will be used depending on the type of title that's being recorded. So on the screen, this is how it is formatted in Polaris and OCLC, it will look a little bit different in regards to spacing. So if you're a subtitle and that's any information, use the qualify title. The font is usually smaller, not as prominent. Um, that will be in A245 subfield A, you'll do space colon subfield B and then the subtitle. If you're an OCLC, there would be a space after the colon. For parallel titles, and that's the title proper in another language, you will do subfield A title proper, space equal sign, subfield B parallel title. In OCLC, there would be a space after the equal sign. For subsequent titles, if there's no collective title and you're having to list the individual movies, TV shows, et cetera, you would do subfield A first title, space, semicolon, subfield B second title, space, semicolon, space, and then the third title, et cetera. Um, OCLC, like before, there would be a space after the first semicolon before the delimiter B. And then if you have other title information, you can do a 245 subfield B with other title information. Next slide, please. So this is our video, Night at the Museum, Battle of the Smithsonian, and this is how it appears on the title screen. Next slide, please. So in the OCLC record, we would have 245, first and second indicator zeros, nine at the museum, colon, space battle of the Smithsonian. When we do our local edits after we export from OCLC, we will, the first part will remain the same, but after battle of the Smithsonian, we will add a subfield H video recording for the GMD. And just to note, this film is part of the night at the museum franchise, hence the, first part of the 245. Next slide, please. Okay, so the statement of responsibility. Uh, this is functions that have overall responsibility for the work. So it will include production companies or companies, screenwriters, producers, directors. It does not include cast, narrators, or other contributors to artistic or technical production. So 
directors of photography, film editors, composers, etc. And all of these in the 245, you'll put those in subfield C, and that is preceded by a backslash. Next slide, please. Okay. We take this recording the statement of responsibility. We will take this from the same source as the title and we'll transcribe it exactly from the source. It's from a source other than the item itself, such as a website, a publisher, um, distributor, you're gonna enter that information in brackets. Uh, Susan just asked, we list, so if we list all those things, is there a max for the amount of information? I have seen super long ones. I've seen super short ones. Ed, anybody else like catalogers judgment? Well, there's no maximum amount of information, but you can also, you know, like if you have multiples, like if you have, you know, five people that they list as screenwriters, RDA does give you that option of just listing the first one and then saying and for others. So you do, you have some options, but there is no, really, there is no limit about how big the statement of responsibility can be. When I was doing a lot more videos, I would typically include like the main names listed on the DVD or on the um, credits. Right. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is our video in the credit frame. It was, produced, distributed by 20th Century Fox, um, 21 laps, and 1492 pictures, and it's a Sean Levy film. Next slide, please. And then you'll see the producers, Sean Levy, Chris Columbus, Michael Barnison, I'm sure I mispronounced that, and it was written by Robert Ben Garant and Thomas Lennon, and then directed by Sean Levy. So all of these people had large roles in making this film and producing it. Next slide, please. So for our video, here are the 245 fields spelled out completely. The first one is the World Cat Record. So you'll notice that the spacing with the punctuation is usually spaced, whatever the punctuation is spaced, whereas with ours, it is generally space, punctuation, and then the next subfield. Um, we also added for the share local edit, the GMD and subfield H video recording. Otherwise, they are pretty much the same. Next slide, please. Okay, so variant titles are variations of the title proper. And that's things like spell out symbols or numbers, record a portion of the title or a part title, correct misspelled words, et cetera. And when we do varying titles, we think of how a patron might search. And as we all know, patrons come up with some very unique searches. So sometimes you'll have quite a few different varying titles just to make sure that this item can be found. A parallel title is a title in another language. So if you have a video that was made in Japan but dubbed for English or has subtitles, you'll have that a lot. And then you have title on resource from other than preferred. Sorry, title on resource from other than preferred source. So if you find the title in the container, or you have to go to the distributor or the publisher's website. And then it is not the title of the contents. Okay. And that will be recorded in a 246 field subfield A variant title. Next slide, please. All right, so our video again. And we are going to look for, see if there's any additional titles that we need to make sure are in there. Um, and there was a question, is a parallel title the same as paired field? I will admit that you have stumped me on this one. Um, anybody? Um, this is Edie. The parallel title is the title in another language. Um, it's not necessarily a paired field. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by a paired field unless you're thinking about like a title in say Korean or Japanese characters and paired with the, like the Romanized part. Um, that's a different thing than just a parallel title. Parallel title just means the title in another language. Thank you, Edie. I've actually not done much for language cataloging, so I was like, what's pair field? I appreciate that. All right, so on our title screen, we do not have an additional title. Next slide, please. 
And then on our disc label, there's also no additional titles. So we can keep going. Next slide. The container front, same thing, no additional titles other than what we've seen. Next slide, please. And then here's the container back in the spine. And we find the same thing. There are no additional titles that we need to record. Next slide, please. So for our video, we will have nine at the museum. And for the World Cat record, we've had nine at the museum, Battle of Smithsonian. And we would do a varying title for the Battle of Smithsonian because that is the title of the individual film. That's part of the Night of the Museum franchise. And when we go to the share local edits, we just add in the G and D in subfield H and the 245. Everything else, it looks the same. Next slide, please. Okay. So our addition statement can be taken from anywhere on the item. It's the same resource as title proper is preferred, but can come from any place. If taken from outside the resource, make sure that you put it in brackets. So if you find it on the publisher's website, just through a page, et cetera. And you're going to transcribe from the source, including capitalization and abbreviation. So back to slide, please. Can you go back one slide? Thank you. OK, so on our item, we if they're or on an item, if you saw a collector's edition, you would do sub or field 250, subfield A, collector's edition. Next slide, please. Okay. So do not record widescreen or full screen as an addition statement unless it's stated as addition or version on the resource. So like widescreen version, full screen version. And you'll also record that in a 345 field. And you have multiple, there are options for multiple addition statements. You can record in one mark tag 250, separated by a comma or in separate 250 fields. And then, Oh, Susan just asked the question, shouldn't there be a subfield B for night? Can we go back? I want to say two slides, maybe. Sue, so can we go back a couple slides? Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more. Okay, so no, there would not be a subfield B because it is part of the franchise title. So let me go back up. Yeah. Okay. If it was a subtitle without franchise title, then yes, you would have a subfield B. Okay. All right. So. That answer your question, Susan? Okay, perfect. We can go back to a distance statement, yeah. Perfect, one more slide. Thank you. Okay, so for original or copy cataloging in OCLC, you can do it with either a single or multiple 250s, either way is acceptable. For share, um, we would you'd add appropriate edition statement to distinguish the format, and there's a list of share cataloging standards. And then you'll combine multiple edition statements in a single 250 separated by a comma to allow all edition statements to appear in the pack brief display. If they're not in one edition statement, only the first edition statement shows up on the pack display. So we're trying to make sure patrons have all the information. Next slide, please. Okay. So an example of this, with the last of the Mohicans, it's the director's expanded edition. And there's also the widescreen version. So what we would do, we would do a tag 250 with a subfield A, director's expanded edition, comma, space, widescreen version, period. If we were in OCLC, we could record those in two separate 250 fields. But like we said, either way is fine. Next slide, please. Okay. So for our, we're going to start looking to see if there's any addition statements. I don't see any on the disc label. Next slide, please. Or on the container front. Next slide. And on the container back, I don't see any, but um, it, the fine print sometimes hides them. I'm, there isn't any on this one, but make sure that when you are looking, read the fine print just in case. Next slide, please. So for our video in the 
240, the OCLT record, we wouldn't put an addition statement because there isn't one listed on the DVD or anywhere that we can find. For a share local edit, we would add the 250 subfield A with DVD in brackets and a period. And we always, there and make sure that there is a period at the end of the 250 even when the addition statement is in brackets. Next slide, please. Okay, so the country of producing entity. The mark tag 257, it's not a core element. It is also newer. Um, so we'll start seeing it more and more. Don't delete if it's present in records. You don't have to add it. Um, probably a good habit to do though is to start doing it. If you do add, use the form and the name and the name authority file, and you'll add a delimiter two or subfield two with code NAF for name authority file. So if your movie was made in Sweden, you would do a 257 with a subfield A, Sweden, delimiter two, NAF, or subfield two, NAF. Next slide, please. And that's, sorry, can we go back one slide? I missed the point. So the country, yeah, the contains the countries or countries where the headquarters of the production companies are located. So you might have to do a little bit of digging, but generally you'll be able to find where those production companies are based out of. Next slide, please. Okay, so publication information. It includes places of production, publication, distribution, and manufacture, and those all go in subfield A. The producer, publisher, distributor, and manufacturer, then those go in subfield B, and then dates go in subfield C. And you can find this information anywhere on the item. For ISBD punctuation, you're gonna do a semicolon before place of publication if there are multiple places, a colon before publisher name in subfield B, a comma before date, for the date in subfield C, and then for the 264, zero, ones, twos, and threes, You'll put a period at the end of the field if the date is not in brackets. The 2644 does not have ending punctuation. Next slide, please. Okay. And you may have multiple 264s for different functions, and those will be denoted by the second indicator. So for 264, as you can see, the 2640, you have your place of production. The 2641 is the place of publication. 264.2 would be distribution, 264.3s would be manufacturing, and then the 264 is your copyright date. Next slide, please. Okay. So you're going to record the place of publication as stated on the item. If needed for clarity, you can add a name, name of country, state, or province in brackets, and do not abbreviate those. You'll record all places named on the item or only the first. You have that choice, so catalogers judgment. And if there's no place of publication on the item, um, you cataloger you can research place and cataloger researches place and enters in brackets or enters the phrase place of publication not identified. We would prefer RDA preference and share local practice is to supply a place of publication even if only a country. If you are having any problems locating it, feel free to reach out to us. Most of us are all of us really are more than happy to try to find an answer for you. Next slide, please. So for the publisher, it can be taken from anywhere on the item, and you're going to transcribe the name of the publisher as it appears on the item, such as Buena Vista Home Entertainment. If you have multiple publishers, record the first publisher. It's optional to add the rest, catalogers judgment. And if no publisher, enter probable name in brackets for the phrase publisher not identified. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the distributor, if there's no publisher on the item, the distributor is core if present. If publisher is present, it's optional to also record the distributor. You can take this from anywhere on the item, and you're going to transcribe the name of it as it appears on the item. So TriStar Home Video. If you're not sure whether an entity is a publisher or distributor, record it as a publisher. We'll make that assumption. Next slide, please. Okay, so for dates, the publication date is a core element, and you're going to use the most recent publication date and use the publication date of the video, not of the original film. Videos rarely have a publication date, though. So the copyright date is the core element if no publication date. If you can't find a copyright for copyright date for the video as a whole, 
you can use the copyright date for the container package and design. And you'll record the copyright date as implied public dictation date in brackets. And you'll record, the, excuse me, you'll record the date of the original film in a 500 note. Next slide, please. So if there's no date on the item, you're gonna estimate a date, which is preferred, or enter the phrase date of publication not identified. So for example, if you can estimate that it was put made in 2010, you'll put 2010 in brackets. If you're uncertain, but it could be 2010, you can do 2010 question mark in brackets. Or if you know it was made in the 90s, you can do between 1990 and 1999 in brackets. So our local practice is, <coughs> sorry about that. Okay, your local practice is to record an estimated date in brackets. Next slide, please. So we're gonna look at our video and see if we can find a publication date, a copyright date, et cetera. So on the disc label, we see 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment, copyright 2009. Next slide, please. Okay, and then on the back of the container and on the spine, we also find copyright 2009, 20th Century Fox. So you can, also, you can generally find a copyright date in tiny print on the bottom. So another instance where just make sure you read the tiny print. You usually have some good information. And then next slide, please. So for our video, a complete two, the complete 264, and you are looking at WorldCat, you would have a 264 first indicator one, or second indicator one, sorry. Beverly Hills, California, subfield B, 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment, the subfield C in brackets because we are using it as an implied date, 2009, with a 264 second indicator for subfield C, copyright 2009. For Polaris, it's going to be the same. The spacing will just look a little different after the punctuation. Any questions about anything that I've talked about? Hearing none, I will turn this over to Katie. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, Sue, if you could progress to the next slide. Um, so we're gonna talk about um, characteristics characteristics and attributes in the three XX fields. Um, so the three XX fields are used to record physical characteristics and other attributes about the item in hand. Um, they can also be used for digital resources too, but today we're talking about specific uh, physical DVDs and Blu-rays. Um, collectively, they help paint a picture of what the item physically is. Um, and the three XX fields are also continually evolving as we've seen recently with some new additions, such as uh, the subfield C and D in the 345. Um, and they'll likely continue to do so as more libraries are more moving towards linked data. Um, when recording physical characteristics and attributes of an item, um, the item itself in hand uh, should be your, your source of information. Um, and make sure to only ever record what is printed or true about the item. Like, and when I say true, I mean, you know, like the size or um, things that you, you know to be true, but otherwise always rely on the printed information on the item um, from the, the screen, the container, the disc, um, using the leveled of, levels of uh, preferred source. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, okay, um, so first we're gonna talk about the 300 field. Um, this field is a useful consolidated field with a lot of information captured within it. Um, a lot of this information is now sometimes repeated elsewhere in the record in other 3XX fields. Um, and more. And as more and more libraries move towards linked data models, um, information is beginning to become more delineated throughout the record. Um, but I still think that the 300 field uh, is a really useful field um, because it's all in one place um, and it's it's easy for patrons to read, it's easy for catalogers to read too. Um, but getting into the 300 field a little bit more specifically, um, it begins with a subfield A, which records both the number of units in the item and the carrier type, um, such as it has it, on, in, um, in books, it would have you know 254 pages or maybe 12 audio discs. For Blu-rays and DVDs, it, it'll it'll list the number of uh, the number of discs. 
for uh, DVDs and Blu-rays always record the carrier type in the 300 as video discs. And that is one word um, and not uh, three DVDs or two Blu-rays, always write them as video discs. Um, RDA has moved away from using abbreviations in records uh, in favor of using plain understandable language. There are, however, a few exceptions. Uh, two of those uh, are two of those are that you can abbreviate hour to HR period and minute to MIN period. Um, this is because they are specific units of measurement in their own right, um, and they're there, they therefore are permitted. Um, if an item uses the word approximately, uh, such as approximately 10 hours and 40 minutes in a runtime, um, always make sure to spell out the word approximately, even if it's been abbreviated in the record or um, sometimes in older records you might see it written as CA, um, make sure to write it out as approximately. Uh, and also when recording runtime of a DVD or Blu-ray, uh, make sure to only record time for the feature presentation. Do not include any time listed for special features or, um, or extra, extra content on the discs. Make sure it's only, only recorded for the feature presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So continuing with the 300 field, um, make sure to also um, make sure to follow correct ISBD punctuation in the 300 field. Um, specifically, the subfield B is preceded by a colon and then ends with a semicolon before the subfield C. Um, so subfield B records physical details, uh, which for DVDs and Blu-rays would, uh, would be sound and color characteristics. Um, for example, uh, include either silent sound or color in black and white. Um, and we'll see some examples of that in a minute. Um, for color characteristics, make sure the language will later match in the uh, 340 field, subfield G. So whatever you list in the 300 sh should also match in the 340. Those two should be uh, the same language used. Um, and again, the term should either be color, black and white, and or sepia, depending on if there's multiple, it, like a movie could be black and white and also in color. Um, but those are the three terms that we will use. So um, those three terms, color, black and white and or sepia. And if the work uh, has a mixture of, of those color sequences, um, you, can, uh, you can use the term uh, color with black and white sequences. Um, and for subfield C in the 300 field, uh, re that records the dimensions or size of an item. For DVDs and Blu-rays, uh, always include the diameter of the disc, not the container. Uh, standard DVDs and Blu-rays will always be four, four and three quarter inches um, and make sure to uh, abbreviate inches into IN period. Um, again, that's because it's a specific unit of measurement. And um, if you ever see dimensions for subfield C uh, for a Blu-ray or DVD listed as 12 centimeters, uh, please change that to the four and three quarters inches before you put it into Polaris. Um, it can remain as 12 centimeters in an OCLC record, but for Polaris, we want to make sure that it is four and three quarters inches. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, and finally, for um, this, this field is not always included on the 300. Uh, or this subfield is not always included in the 300 field. Um, but if the item has an accompanying material, like a booklet or another kind of disc, um, like if it's a DVD Blu-ray combo pack, or if it's a DVD with an audio disc, um, make sure that you add a subfield E for the accompanying material. Um, subfield, subfield E is always at the end of that field and preceded by a plus sign, um, as demonstrated in the example at the bottom there. Um, where it says plus subfield E one program guide. Um, and the carrier type stated in subfield E does not need to come from any controlled vocabulary. Um, the 300, not 300, the three XX fields, um, as we'll see, has a lot of uh, controlled vocabulary. And then also there are fields without controlled vocabulary. So we'll, I'll always make sure to state if it uses controlled vocabulary or not. Um, and then, Following the subfield E, 
um, write out the details of the item um, as if you were repeating uh, subfields A through C in the 300 field again um, with ISBD punctuation, but without, without the actual subfields and put it all within parentheses. So with the program, program guide, it's lists 40 pages, it has illustrations and it's 24 centimeters. But, but don't include the actual subfields A, B, and C again, just, just write it out without those subfields. Um, so in this example, um, the 300 field tells you that there are four video discs um, and we don't yet know if they're DVD or Blu-ray, that will come later in the record. Um, and the work has sound and color. The disc is standard size and is included with a 40 page program um, that is 24 centimeters tall and includes illustrations. So um, I really like the 300 field because everything, a lot of what you need to know about the item is all in one field and right there for you. Um, and uh, the 300 field will be visible in the pack for patrons. Um, and many of the three XX, although many of the three XX fields are not. Um, so it is important that the information is accurate and formatted accurate and formatted correctly with proper ISBD punctuation uh, in this 300 field, especially. Um, uh, next slide, please. So now we're gonna start looking at um, the our example. Um, so right now we can see that um, the, using the same example, continuing on, um, you can see that we have one disc on this item. And then moving to the next slide. Uh, next, you can see the length of the film. Um, and remember, only include the length of the feature presentations, presentation, uh, no extra special features. Um, and also, just a tip, um, when you see uh, the back of a DVD or Blu-ray box, and it has this, this box um, you know, that we have, the circle is uh, within that kind of big box area. Um, there's a lot of information that is useful to the three, uh, three XX fields in here. Um, not every Blu-ray or DVD will have this uh, kind of, this box with all, with all this information on the back cover, um, but it's more, it's more common with feature films. Um, but when you see it, I, I like to think of it as kind of gold, like you, you've hit the jackpot when you see that box because all the information is consolidated right there for you. And then next slide. Um, so here is what the 300 field would look like for this item, both as a WorldCat or OCLC record and in Polaris. Um, note that when adding to or editing, editing OCLC, the spacing is different than in, in a Polaris record. Um, WorldCat or OCLC require spaces between ISBD, ISBD punctuation and the double daggers or delimiters. Um, in Polaris, record things with no spaces between the ISBD punctuation and the double daggers. Um, keep this in mind when switching between the two, um, between OCLC and um, Polaris. Mark report, also, like Polaris, also requires there to be no spaces between the punctuation and double daggers. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, so now we're moving on to the 3-3x fields, um, and these are some of the uh, first uh, fields introduced after RDA replaced AACR2. Um, these three fields record the content, media, and carrier type of an item. Uh, content describes the form of communication through which the content is expressed. So like with a, with a book, it would be text, um, audio book would be spoken word, and Blu-rays and DVDs are either two-dimensional moving object um, for regular format DVDs, um, and, uh, or it would be three-dimensional moving object if the movie is in a 3D format, but only if it's in a 3D format. Um, I'm just reading this comment here. Um, I think Mark Report removes the spaces when I've checked uh, my imports in Mark Report. Uh, that is correct. It, it will remove the spaces, um, but when you're typing, like if you're editing within Mark Report, just make sure that you're not putting the spaces in either. I think, I don't know if it'll mark it as incorrect if you do, or if it'll fix it for you at that point, if you accidentally do. Um, and then uh, moving on here, uh, media type describes the type of uh, intermediation the device needs to access the content. Um, so books would be unmediated because you don't need any uh, technology or media to access their content. Whereas DVDs and Blu-rays require video to access their content. And then carrier describes the format of the storage medium of the content. So books are stored in a volume and Blu-ray uh, and, and a Blu-ray movie is to stored within a video disc. 
Um, and if your uh, item has any significant accompanying material, make sure to also record that within the 33X fields pertaining to the content media and carrier type for that material. So if you're if your DVD comes with a book that is really important to the, the work, maybe it's uh, like a great courses DVD where it has the DVD and the, the guidebook at the same time, you'll wanna make sure that you have the 33X fields for both matters. Um, and then use the uh, subfield three, uh, subfield three, um, only when you need to differentiate between 3-3x fields that wouldn't be easily apparent. Um, so if you have like a DVD Blu-ray combo pack um, and the DVD uh, and, and the Blu-ray is a 3D movie, but the DVD is not, um, you would want to include um, the two 336 fields, one with two dimensional moving object and the other with three dimensional moving object. Um, but then you would want to be clear which 336 represents the DVD and which rep represents the Blu-ray. So you would add a subfield three at the end of uh, both the Blu-ray and DVD, uh, both at the ends of the lines um, listing Blu-ray or DVD um, assigned accordingly. And then um, subfield three, um, the, the subfield three is really uh, don't need to be used very often. Um, if you have accompanying material of a completely different material, like a book and a DVD, um, subfield threes are not necessary because it would be very clear which would be the um, which which would pertain to the book and which would pertain to the DVD. Um, and also, uh, as a note, three three x and three four x fields do not show up in Polaris. Um, eventually, they hopefully will, but until then, we are repeating work in the hopes of having these fields. Uh, in place for once um, packs do uh, begin to use them. Um, again, probably as we move towards linked data kind of models. Um, and the subfield three, uh, the, the subfield three fields um, do not display in the pack. So um, for right now, they are more used to catalogers than patrons. Um, if you do see them in an OCLC record, it's okay to leave them in um, since other libraries packs might be able to display that information. Uh, but when importing them into Polaris, they can be removed, again, unless that information is really important to be differentiated, like in that um, 3D Blu-ray regular DVD combo pack example. Um, and then, Katie, I, yeah. Katie, before you move on, mm -hmm. we are actually displaying the 3, 4x fields in the oh, pack. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But we, yeah, we don't display the 3, 3x three fields, but we do display the 3, 4x. And eventually okay. we want to... Um, customize the pack so that it will display that subfield three. Okay, so a subfield three on a three, four X field will be visible, just not on a three, three X field. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure that the three, the subfield three is displaying anywhere right now. Okay. Um, but I think we will eventually get the pack customized to display mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think sometimes a lot of the work we do right now um, in the 3.3x or 3.4x fields is kind of work that we're doing for, for the future. Um, sometimes it feels like we're repeating our work a lot, especially between what's in the 300 field um, is often repeated elsewhere in the 3x, 3xx fields. But I kind of view it as, as doing work for future catalogers and, and future systems to be able to use, even if we can't use it right now. Um, and then uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, so this is, um, so when cataloging uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, um, here are the uh, content media and carrier types you'll be using for both formats. Um, the 3.3x three, three fields uh, can be a bit tedious to type out by hand uh, and to memorize if you have. Um, so we do recommend, recommend using macros or text strings to generate the 3.3x three, three fields in OCLC for you. Um, but note when you use text strings, um, be sure to verify all the information is correct as it won't generate according to specifications uh, you input the way that macros do. Um, it's just copy and and paste a text line of text. Um, so just make sure that if you're pasting something in through a text string that it, it actually does pertain to the, the item in hand. Um, so as you can see for the content type, um, for a DVD or a Blu-ray, it will always be either two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Again, three-dimensional only if it's a 3D movie. Um, and then the media type will always be video and the carrier type will always be video disc um, for both Blu-ray and DVD. And then moving on to the next slide. 
Um, so now we're doing the three, four X fields. Um, and when recording three, four X fields, uh, prior to guidelines, or prior guidelines allowed some subfields to be combined into one line. So you might often see a three, four, four field sub, you might often see a three, four, four field, um, 344 field uh, with subfields A and B all on one line. Um, now OCLC requires uh, that when you record your 34X fields, make sure that uh, they are all separated into their own lines. Um, or if you see, um, so if you're doing it yourself, make sure you separate them. Um, or if you see them combined in a record, make sure you separate them as well. Um, you will see probably a lot of them in slightly older records where they're all combined onto one line. So just, just make sure to separate them out if you see them. Um, the exception um, is the three, four, uh, 341 field, um, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, and then when recording three, four X fields, um, many will need to be controlled. Many will use controlled vocabulary um, and will need to end with a subfield two RDA code. Um, you can find these controlled vocabularies from lists on the RDA registry website um, and links to these lists can be found in the bibliographic formats and standards entry for each subfield and subfield. Um, and if you're recording a term that does not come from a controlled vocabulary, um, then do not include a subfield two at the end of the field. Sometimes you might see in, uh, in other records in OCLC or even in Polaris maybe um, a field where it doesn't use controlled vocabulary and it just ends with subfield two RDA, but with no code at the end, um, that, that would be incorrect. Um, as long as that, that term does, is not from con controlled vocabulary, you wanna make sure you get rid of that subfield two at the end completely. Um, but, but absolutely make sure that it, it definitely doesn't come from a controlled vocabulary first. Um, and as described before, only use uh, subfield three when you really need to differentiate information um, that is necessary. And this time, unlike before, where the subfield three goes at the end of the line, uh, this time it goes at the beginning of the line, um, with one exception again, and that's the 341 field, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, the 341 field just likes to defy expectations. Um, but it's, it's a really good field. I, I think you'll like it when we get to it. Um, so we can move on to the, the next slide. Um, so starting with the 340 field, um, this is used to record dimensions, color content, um, and sometimes information about recording methods. Um, for DVDs and Blu-rays, uh, these are common subfields you will use for this field, um, which again, we need to, um, uh, or which again you need to have on separate lines. Um, so don't have any uh, don't have any A and B or B and A on the, the same line. Um, uh, so sorry, I lost place where my notes was. Um, so subfield B uh, records the dimensions. These dimensions should match whatever is in the 300 field. Um, it is technically optional to include the dimensions again as a 340 field, but we do recommend including them. Um, this, this is work. This is again work that we're kind of doing for future catalogers and future uh, packs that can read this information. Um, there's, uh, although I guess our, ours does show the 340s, um, but I think it's it's it'll become more useful in future years, um, and uh, there is no controlled vocabulary for the dimensions recorded in sub subfield B. So you do not need a subfield two at the end. So as you can see in this example here, it it is simply subfield B four and three quarter inches, um, and for Blu-ray and DVD that that's going to be your standard three forty subfield B. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so subfield D on this, on, in the subfield, in the 340 field, um, records uh, information, uh, records inf recording method information. Um, for DVDs and Blu-rays, uh, if they are recordable, um, if they are recordable DVDs and Blu-rays, so on the disc itself, it would say DVD-R or BDR, um, then you have to record this as this in, in the record. Um, use the controlled vocabulary burning 
um, at the end with the uh, subfield 2 RDA PM at the end of that field. Um, these disks are rare to see. Um, so if you have one, make sure to include it in the record. Um, or if it's already included in the record, I would just double check your disk to make sure that it is definitely actually a recordable disk, because um, it is really pretty rare for, for us to see that I think most of, most of what we tend to buy, um, and at least what I see is commercially produced disks. Um, and if the disk is commercially produced, um, like our example that we're following, um, it is optional to include the 340 subfield D field. Um, if you do include it, um, it would it would be the stamping, um, it would be 340 subfield D stamping with uh, uh, subfield 2 RDA PM as well. Um, and uh, if you see stamping listed in a record, it's it's fine to leave it. I mean, that's work that's that's work that has been done that is not incorrect. Um, but you don't have to include it if it's not already present. Um, since since con, um, commercial commercially produced discs are just widely, uh, most of them will always be stamping. So um, basically, the the burnt, the recordable discs are kind of the uh, abnormal disks. So we want to make sure that if you see those, those are recorded in the record, but all others are kind of mostly assumed to be commercially produced. Um, but, but definitely always check that when you get a, when you get a disc coming in for Blu-ray or DVD. Um, next field, please, or next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so subfield G records the color content. Um, and there are currently two controlled vocabulary terms for this field, um, that's polychrome and monochrome. Um, and if used, this field will end with the subfield RDA, uh, C, uh, subfield 2 RDA CC. Um, only use these terms, the polychrome and monochrome, um, if the item in hand specifically states that, um, that it uses either, either polychrome or monochrome. Um, our practices in SHARE and also um, OLAC is to follow the Library of Congress's practices um, of using these other three other terms instead. Um, we use either color, black and white, or sepia, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and then the feet, because this is not controlled vocabulary, the field will not end in a subfield two. Um, terms like polychrome and monochrome uh, can be a bit confusing to patrons. Um, so we have opted to use more plain language in our records. Um, so as you can see at the bottom of the slide, um, it simply says subfield uh, 340, subfield G color. Um, if it was polychrome or monochrome, you would end it with that subfield two. Um, if also, if you have multiple uh, sequences of color on your item, so if you have black and white and color, you would have separate 340 fields for both uh, subfield G color and subfield G black and white. Um, so just make sure that those are separated out. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so now we've got to the 341 field um, that, as I said before, kind of defies all expectations um, of the 340 fields. Um, so, uh, so this field, um, is one of the newer RDA fields, uh, and it describes accessibility content in the item. Um, this includes information about visual, textual, auditory, and or tactile modes of access in either primary or secondary content in a resource. Um, so if the resource says something like, has the, the uh, acronym S SDH or audio description, um, then you will definitely need to include a 341 field. Um, but uh, if, the, if the resource only set has the term subtitles with no SDH included, um, so SDH stands for um, uh, uh, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so if you see that term, subtitles for the deaf and hard of he hearing, um, or the term captions, um, or the term uh, audio description, then you know that this is an accessibility content. Um, this is accessibility content. Um, if you only see the word subtitles, um, technically that is only a literal translation of the language of the movie, um, and it's not an assistive accessibility method, um, which would which would more likely include things like describing when sound is present in the movie um, and things like that. So. Um, there is currently no controlled vocabulary for this field, so it would not include a subfield two at the end. Um, it is, 
and uh, if it is necessary to include a subfield three to differentiate fields um, pertaining to different materials, um, then the subfield three will go at the end of this field, unlike all the other 340X fields. Um, so just to clarify that, because I feel like I kind of jumbled that a bit, um, if you see captions, SDH, or, or it's spelled out subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, um, or, uh, uh, what was the last term, or audio description, then that is tech, that is accessibility content and you will need a 341. But if you only see the term subtitles with no CC little cap closed caption block or anything like that, um, then that is not accessibility content and you do not need a 341. Um, also, um, if you have a 341 field, this will always need to be in conjunction with a 532 field um, and vice versa. Um, you can't have one without the other. The 532 will describe in longer language um, what is in the field and the 341 are codes and, and, uh, length and terms for to describe the 532. So if you, if you need to enter a 341 or a 532, make sure you always put the other one in there too. And um, uh, Linda will talk more about the 532 after me. Uh, so next, um, oh, thank you, Edie, yeah, Edie, yeah. Um, sometimes you'll see audio description noted as DVS on the item as well. Um, we, we love our acronyms in this, this, this field, don't we? <laughs> um, there's always acronyms and terms and codes that we need to remember and memorize for, for all of this content. Um, so, uh, um, yep, you're on the next slide. Um, so here are two examples of, of accessibility notes um, for different features. Um, the first example in the slide is for accessible, accessible audit, auditory content, um, and the mode of access is captions. Um, so um, the second example is for accessible visual content, and the mode of access uh, is audio description. Um, so in the first, you see the word captions, um, if you see the word captions or some combination of SDH um, uh, then or subtitles for the deaf and hearing, then you will make sure that you include uh, a 341 subfield A auditory and subfield B captions um, with no subfield 2 RDA at the end of that. Um, and uh, if the item um, and if the item has a descriptive track or says DVS on it, um, then you'll want to include that second example, um, the 341 uh, first indicator zero, uh, subfield A visual, subfield D audit audio description. Um, and this is also a field um, that I am personally quite a fan of. Um, I think making sure that um, to record all accessible features um, and not just in a note field, but in a way that can later be used more fully in linked data and things like that will, um, will be helpful to people um, going forward. So this is just a, another way to make sure that we record accessibility content um, and make it clear when items have um, these kind of features available. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm a little stuffed up today. So it's like, you know, breathing through your nose and your mouth at the same time is difficult for me, apparently. Um, so the 344 field um, is a slightly older RDA field uh, that has more recently been separated out. Um, yeah, it is that time of year, Susan. Um, so uh, this field has more recently been sorted out so that each subfield um, has its own line. Um, so therefore you might often come across records in Polaris and OCLC that have at least the, um, the subfield A and subfield B condensed onto one line together. If you see this, make sure to separate them out and include proper subfield twos at the end of uh, each each line um, because this is controlled vocabulary um, that it um, that come that it comes from those registries. Um, so for DVDs and Blu-rays, um, the subfield A should always say subfield A digital subfield two RDA TR, and the subfield B should always say um, sub, uh, optical subfield two RDA RM. Um, and these two lines should be included in every Blu-ray and DVD record. That is the same for Blu-rays and DVDs. Um, later, we will see um, fields that differentiate between Blu-ray and DVD. Um, additional subfields uh, like G and H should only be included if the information is specifically stated on your item. Um, and uh, uh, note that the subfield G, uh, the term in there, surround, comes from a controlled vocabulary, so it should always be uh, 
it should end with a subfield 2 RDA CPC. Um, whereas subfield H does not come from a controlled vocabulary, so it will not end in subfield 2. Um, also, you might see things written on your item like Dolby Digital 5.1 uh, 5 or Dolby Digital Surround. Um, record these terms exactly as written on the item. Um, and if there are multiple terms, um, uh, if there are multiple terms, uh, uh, like like there are there's Dolby Digital 5.1 and also Dolby Dolby Digital Sound on one item, um, then include all all versions of this written in different 344 fields. Um, so you as you can see here, you might have uh, two two different subfield H's for Dolby Digital or for for Dolby uh, surround descriptions in a 344 field. Um, and is stereo considered a default with modern media? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know that it is actually. Um, does anyone else know if stereo is considered default? I, I was. I didn't think it was, but I'm. I could be wrong on that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of items have surround. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it it might have been in the past, but I'm not sure um, if it is anymore. I I will say I don't. I see surround on um, at least. Uh, sort of like commercially produced DVDs more often than I see stereo. Um, but, but if it says stereo, absolutely record that in the subfield G um, with the subfield 2 RDA CPC. Um, oh, audio, yes, audiobooks I think are more often stereo, uh, stereo than, than movies are. Um, yeah, that, that, I think that is true. Um, so next, uh, next field, next slide, please. Okay, um, so the subfield I um, is a very new RDA field that was introduced uh, just within the last few months. Um, I like this field a lot um, because it's very simple. It just states if there is or isn't sound uh, in the content of the item. Um, so the terms are controlled vocabulary. Um, so each should always end with RDA, with subfield two RDA SEO. Um, and also make sure that if you, um, that uh, the sound or silent is noted in the subfield B of the 300 field. Um, so anytime or every time, because it, it needs to be included on every item, um, you include sound or silent, um, then you include that on the, uh, uh, on, in the 300 field as well. Um, all right, next, uh, next slide. Okay, um, so the 345 field, um, we hadn't previously used this field um, for Blu-rays and DVDs. It was previously used only in records for motion picture film um, and not uh, video discs. Um, so uh, two subfields have now been established um, that we can use with uh, Blu-ray and DVD discs. Um, so on your item, if you see an aspect ratio information, uh, uh, then in a note, um, so if you see it written in a, in a 500 or a, um, in, in one of the 5XX fields, um, that information will now need to be included on, in, the, in a 345 uh, instead. Um, and of course, if you see it written on the item itself um, and verify that it's written on the item, um, you record what's on the item itself. Um, so, uh, you record, so the 345 subfield C uh, records the aspect ratio itself um, often you'll see things written like um, 16 uh, colon nine, that's a very common aspect ratio. The 2.34 colon one is also another one. Um, so that is not a controlled vocabulary. Um, it won't end with a subfield two, but the subfield D in the 345 is a controlled vocabulary. And uh, there is a, a wide dislike of the widescreen being two words. Um, I think a lot of people preferred writing it as one word, but it is in the controlled vocabulary written as two words, widescreen, um, with a subfield two RDA AR. Um, so just if you're used to writing widescreen as one word, uh, just kind of be aware of that and um, catch yourself before you put it in there. Um, uh, yep, uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, the 346 field 
records the video format and broadcast standards. Um, the subfield A should only be used for analog recordings, so VHS or beta, um, and never used for DVDs or Blu-rays, um, which are always digital. Um, so never use a subfield A when cataloging a DVD or Blu-ray, just wanted to note that. Um, and if a broadcast standard uh, stated on your item um, or if a broadcast standard is stated on your item, um, such as NTSC, uh, PAL, um, or CCAM, um, and others, uh, make sure you record that, uh, but only if it is listed. Um, these uh, terms do come from a controlled language, um, and so this subfield should always, so the field should always end with a subfield to RDABS. Um, NTSC is the most common broadcast standard in the US. Um, so for me, when I see a broadcast standard other than NTSC, um, that is a flag for me. Um, that means I always check the region of the movie as well. Um, so if the broadcast standard is in PAL, P-A-L, um, for instance, um, sometimes the region might be a two instead of a one. Um, so that a, a, a region two will only play on devices in the UK, France, and Spain, but not in the US. Um, at my last library, we sometimes ran into a few issues where we accidentally bought DVDs from regions that couldn't play on most US devices. Um, so um, there are some devices that can play all regions, um, but there are many that cannot. So um, if you do see a broadcast standard other than NTSC, just to me, that's just a flag to, to also check the region. Um, and if your uh, item's broadcast standard does not match the, um, the standard on the item, um, or if the record, if the if what's on the item and what's in the record do not match, um, you'll have to use a different record or make a different record um, because they they cannot be mixed. Um, they are they are they need different records. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, the three forty seven fields um, record the file type encoding format and regional encoding and and file size. Um, this is finally where we are able to differentiate, differentiate between a Blu-ray and a DVD in the three XX fields. Um, for Blu-rays and DVDs, the subfield should always be, a subfield A should always be video file, subfield two, RDA, FT. Um, and again, this is a controlled vocabulary, um, but uh, subfield B will differ be between Blu-ray and DVD. Um, subfield B uh, terms do not come from a controlled vocabulary, so do not include a subfield two. Um, it'll either be DVD video or Blu-ray. And if a region is listed on your item in hand, then record that in a subfield E, um, a 347 subfield E, um, but only if it's listed on the item. Um, and the term is controlled, so it will end with a subfield two RDA RE. Um, and also just as a note, um, if a Blu-ray is listed as region C, um, then use the term uh, it, uh, 347 subfield E, region C, and then in, in uh, parentheses Blu-ray, uh, because this distinguishes it from video games, uh, since some video games are uh, produced on Blu-ray discs, like PlayStation, I think, uses Blu-ray discs for at least their PS4 uh, uh, games. I don't know if PS5 is also on Blu-ray discs. I think they are. Um, Next slide, please. And then um, the 380 field records a class or genre of the work. Um, always use a genre or, or for, genre or form term um, uh, from the Library of Congress uh, genre form terms um, for library and archival materials. So the LCGFT uh, where possible. Um, always include the most general term pertaining to the work in hand. Um, so use motion pictures instead of fantasy fiction films or, um, or science fiction films. Um, so you just, you don't want, you're not trying to get specific here. You're just trying to give a very general sense of what this item is. Um, and then also as a note, um, as you might've noticed on the two examples in the slides, there is no period between the term um, and the subfield two. So in the 655s where you usually put the genre terms, um, there's always a period between the term and the subfield two, um, but in this, in the 380, um, there is no, uh, no period. Um, I kept making that mistake when I first learned about this field and Mark Report would get angry at me every time. So just as a warning, don't put that period in there. <laughs> um, and then next slide. So now we're moving back on to our example. Um, so in this, in the um, menu screen here, we can see that um, 
Uh, Katie. Yep. There is a question in the oh. chat okay. um, from Gwen. It says, do we need a subfield three DVD on DVDs? Um, oh, for the 347 field? Um, uh, if if the yes if if you um, oh before region um, yes if the if you have so if you have like a Blu-ray DVD combo pack and both of them are um, or one of them is region one and another is a different region um, you would definitely want to have a subfield three at the um, beginning of the 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 field right before subfield E specifying which. Uh, which item is sub is region one and which is region two, um, but again only if um, if you need to differentiate that information. Um, if both are region one, then you wouldn't need to do that. Um, or if it's very clear, um, uh, or, or if you have a the region C Blu-ray, um, you wouldn't need to specify Blu-ray at the beginning of that field with a subfield three. Um, so yeah, again only if it's necessary to make sure that. Um, a cataloger or a patron will understand that information and know which one is is which region. Um, does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, so for the the, men, the disk menu here, um, we can see that uh, this work includes 5.1 Dolby digital audio in addition to Dolby surround sound. Um, so we will need to make sure that we include two separate lines for those features when we catalog this. Um, also, the menu states that subtitles are included, um, but remember, unless the subtitles are stated to be for the deaf and hard of hearing or include the, the acronym SDH um, next to it, then it will not need a 341 uh, audio accessibility field. Um, only, if, only if it says captions, SDH, or spelled out uh, subtitles for the, hard of, for the deaf and hard of hearing, um, then it will need a 341. So in this situation, we know that it will not need a 341 field. Um, so next, next slide. And um, this, this image might be a little hard to read. Um, I don't know how big it is on your screens, um, but on the back of the container, we can see again that the item does include 5.1 Dol Dolby Digital um, Audio and Dolby Surround. Um, and we can see that the work has NTSC broadcast standard and is region one. Um, and uh, just as a tip, the region and the broadcast standard are also printed pretty close together. Um, not always, but uh, on commercially produced works, they are often pretty close together. Um, also on DVDs and Blu-rays, um, they often won't print the words region one or, or the region um, on the, the container. Instead, you'll see an oval image of a globe uh, with a number inside of that. Um, so on this container, you can see in that very small, smaller circle, um, you can see the region one code is listed as the, the oval globe symbol instead of written out which region it is. Um, so that's just a, a tip for if you're trying to find the region and, and it's not spelled out on your container for you. And then right below that uh, oval globe, it does, it does list the NTSC. Um, so that's just a tip. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Um, so for our 33X fields, um, as we begin, the, begin to build the record for this item, um, we will um, after the 300 field, uh, we will include the 336, 37, and 38, um, which will be the same for all Blu-rays and DVDs, unless there is a 3D movie included with this. Um, so on our DVD, it would be a simple two-dimensional moving object, a video, and a video disc for the, um, the content, the uh, media, and the carrier. And then next slide. And then for our three, four X fields, um, we will make sure to include the dimensions and the color content and then 340 fields. Um, since we have determined that the item only uses plain subtitles and not captions or subtitles for the deaf, and deaf or hard of hearing, um, then there will not be a 341 field um, included. The 344 subfield A and B will uh, be digital and then optical respectively. Um, and every time and, and every time we have it for Blu-ray and DVDs, we should have the digital and optical. Um, for sound characteristics, uh, we determined that it was recorded using surround sound and Dolby Digital 5.1. So both of those are recorded. Um, and then we also know that the movie has sound. So we will record that in the subfield I. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, uh, next we record the aspect ratio and designator. Um, for this container, we could see that the aspect ratio for the primary work is 2.35 colon one. Um, so that's recorded in subfield C of, of 345. Um, and it's not, and that is not from any controlled vocabulary. Um, and then we will also record that the movie is widescreen um, in the 345 subfield D, making sure to type widescreen as two words and not one. Um, and then we will also record that it uses the NTSC broadcast standard in the 346 and the region in region one in 347. And the 347 uh, fields will always have a video file um, RDA F2 in the subfield A. And then uh, in subfield B, it will finally differentiate whether or not it's a Blu-ray or a DVD um, with no controlled language, with, with no controlled language, so no, no subfield two. Um, and lastly, we will record the more general genre term um, in the 380, making sure not to include a period between the term and the subfield two, um, like you would do in a 655. Um, so I feel like I went through that pretty quickly. Um, I feel like the, the three the three 3x fields are a lot. Um, I'm just reading the comment right now. Um, oh, OK. Um, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I, I have always seen the like the Dolby Digital 5.1 um, without a uh, as as not controlled language. Um, so that is good to know. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas. Um, yeah, that yeah. I, and 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 one thing that I think we all know as catalogers is that things are always updating. Um, so it's always good to just know know what has changed and what is what is now uh, acceptable practice. Um, uh, so now that we have discussed how to catalog the characteristics and attributes of a DVD and Blu-ray, um, are there any questions um, before I pass it on to Linda, who will discuss the series and notes uh, of a record? Um, Katie, I'll yep. just say that Dolby Digital 5.1 mm -hmm. is not um, on that controlled vocabulary. The word oh, okay. Dolby by itself is, but if you look at the definition of it, um, mm -hmm. It says Dolby as pertaining to analog, I think. So that's why when we um, recorded it here, we did not include the subfield two, because mm -hmm. in this case, we're doing Dolby as it applies to a digital recording. Um, mm -hmm. So that was my reasoning when I created these slides and I left off that subfield two, but, okay. but Dolby actually is a is a term on that RDA registry list where Dolby 5.1 is not. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that is, that's very good to know. Um, yeah, they, they never, they never make it just simple, right? Um, there's always exceptions and, and, and small things that you have to remember. There's a lot of memorization and cataloging, um, but are there, are there any questions um, before we, before we move on to Linda with the series notes and uh, series and notes section? I know there was a lot of information in that section of three, three, three X fields. I'm sure it was wildly exciting. <laughs> no, it was very useful. Very good information. Okay. Um, before we move on to the series and notes, Jennifer, did you want to look at all at the poll? Um, or are you just going to take that information and, and kind of look at it later? Um, so we, most people have responded to it and the majority of people who have responded aren't really using call number, collection, shelf location. There are a few. Um, so definitely email me if you're doing something different. Joel, I did get your email. I will reply after the meeting. Um, we're just trying to get an idea of what we can do going forward to make it easier for patrons. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking, because I don't think we're going to get through um, notes and everything that we need to talk about before 11 and we're certainly not going to get through the whole rest of the presentation i'm thinking maybe we just go ahead and linda maybe talk about series because that's that's not going to take too long and then maybe we save the rest of it for february i agree okay because we don't want to rush the rest of it. And we certainly will have more than 15 minutes worth of material. So we'll just talk about the series and then we'll start in February with the notes. All right, so Linda, take it away. Okay, I might have time to do the cool things I cataloged in addition to series if you want to skip oh, that's to that. True. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, why don't we do that? All right. I'll have to share my screen on, on the cool things to catalog, but um, I'll get started on the series. The series, there's not a whole lot of new information because RDA hasn't made any changes and it remains the same across all the formats. The source of information in the 490 can be found on the item, within the item, or even from an outside source if applicable. It includes a subfield A series statement, a subfield B, B series numbering with a semicolon before the subfield B. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Oh, I'm sorry, my fault. I'm looking at my screen and didn't see you had it up on that screen. Okay, the 490, it uses the series statement as it appears on the resource. The 8XX uses the series as it's established in the series authority record. It, a reminder to always be sure to check the series authority record. Sometimes the series statements um, our code is untraced when in reality they're really traced. So just make sure you check. The 800 is personal name or family name. The 811 is corporate body name. The 811 is conference or meeting name. And the 830s is for series established under a title. So can we go to the next, next screen? Here's some examples that we have. The first one is established under the name of the author and the second established under the title. All right, next slide, please. We're gonna take a look at our disc label and does anybody there see a series statement? Next slide, please. Container front, any series statements? And then the next slide, that's our video container and spine. We do not have any series statements on our piece. It is actually a franchise title. So we're going to um, skip the notes and do that in February, but I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show some cool things that I've cataloged. Can you see my screen yet? No, yet. Sue needs to stop sharing first and then you can share yours. Okay. Sorry guys, I'm trying. No, while Sue is working on that, um, that cool things we've cataloged is just kind of something new we added to, um, you know, because we get some unusual, interesting, unique things here to catalog. So I just thought we would show <clears throat> something that we've got in recently that Linda has worked on. Okay, can you see my screen now? No. Not oh. yet. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a kit that I received uh, from a library that had been uh, collected by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And you can see some of the items that were included in the, clip, in the kit. And here's a picture of one of the items. That's a coyote skull. And each of the 10 different animals, there was a skull and um, a pelt, except for the deer, but they didn't send a deer skull. I guess they figured it was too big to fit in the box. So this, these are pictures of the pelts. That's a portion of a deer pelt, uh, a red fox and a coyote. And 
Just because I'm a 12 year old boy at heart, this made me laugh. These are rubber replicas of the Coyote Scat and Paw Prints. And um, my son is a science teacher and he had a chance to take a look at this kit and he wants one for his classroom. So I, it was fun for me to catalog. And I also thought, how neat is it for kids to get a chance to get an opportunity to take a look at this and learn about nature and animals. So this is one of the fun things I've done. And it was kind of silly and I was glad to show my coworkers the, the furs I had. All right, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Linda. That was really cool to see. Um, so does anyone have any questions for any of our catalogers, anything we covered today, any questions in general? Oh, uh, Jane just posted, FYI, the DNR has other similar kits available and you can check it out on their website. And I know at some previous libraries, we got them and they were really cool. There's tons of options, so definitely explore it if you're interested. And Bonnie says, really interesting, Linda. Thank you for sharing. Interested to see how you catalog it. And then Gloria asks, do you have a link? I can get you a link real quick. Give me a minute. Yeah. All right. I just put a link for IDNR in the chat box. And you can also search in Polaris using, I believe, Illinois Department of Natural Resources or IDNR, and that should bring up quite a few kits as, as well. Okay. Any other questions? All right, then hearing none. Our next training session will be Tuesday, February 8th, 2022 at 9 p.m. Oh, uh, yes, I can show the poll again. Give me one second. For anybody who hasn't participated and wants to, I'll put it back up. Okay. Okay, so yeah, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, I will see, we'll, I'll see everyone in about a month and we're happy to see you all today. Have a great day.